I was in solitary confinement for six months. The best way to describe it, you living in a bathroom. That's it, the best way to describe it. You living in a bathroom with a bed, and your desk, and your toilet. In the back of the cell, you got a window, but the window was all foggied up and like scratched up, like so you can't even see out the window. Man, I felt like my life was over. Why well, take the rest of your freedom? And they say that's the most important thing you can take from a person in life is time, because you can never ever get it back ever. You can't go back in time and rewind time. So it's like, my thing is, why lock somebody up? Why you locked up? You know what I'm saying? You trying to kill a spirit even more. What's wrong uh, is with prolonged solitary confinement. The deprivation of social contact by itself uh, constitutes a, a sort of uh, moral suffering uh, that the state is in, uh, in, has no business inflicting, no matter what the person has done. Long-term solitary confinement for juveniles, once a rare form of punishment, has become widespread in American jails and prisons. Critics say it's cruel and unusual punishment, but many states have steadfastly refused to end the practice. Two cases show the range of offenses that can put a child in isolation for months or even years on end. Corey Bauer, age 13, was held in solitary confinement following his conviction for several minor crimes, the worst of which was stealing a television from his school. Michael Kemp was convicted of armed robbery at age 17. When, when you get charged as an adult, you automatically go in solitary confinement. And then there's just so many stories you heard when you're coming up about jail and the dog side so violent, how, you know what I'm saying, people get raped in there. Then we was young, I was smaller than this. I was. 150 at the most, soaking wet. And I was just like, man, I'm about to go in here with these adults. Okay, you have a 16-year-old show up at your jail, your adult jail, uh, and he, she, mostly he, is slight uh, and, uh, and looks young and vulnerable and is young and vulnerable. Uh, and so he's gonna go on the, you know, into protective custody. Um, it, so facto, it just, like night follows day. He was 13 when he was first put in solitary confinement. It wasn't called solitary confinement, it was called protective custody. He was a small kid um, in a facility with kids ranging in age from 10 to 21. He had never lived away from home, he had never um, he had never been in a fight in his life. He went into general prison population in this facility, general population, and he became a target right away. So he ended up in protective custody, which was 24 hours a day in a cell by himself all day, every day. You really feel every hour of being in that cell and you ain't really moving around or nothing and you got bars instead of a door. And it's just like, man, you can go stir crazy in there reading them books and poetry which really kept me sane during that time and I hope because if it ain't that you you, you gotta talk to the person next to you knock on the wall and just try to man have some type of communication you need some type of communication with somebody or you're gonna go crazy I still think he's gonna work the program and come home and even if he doesn't he'll spend a few months there and then he'll still come home right it'll still be fine I don't understand what I've done or how serious any of this is until I talk to, to I go and see the lawyer and then he's the first one that tells me the state's adjudicated your son delinquent, he's never coming home. And he says to me when he's 18 is when he'll be released. And at that point you might as well buy him a bus ticket to the Angola State Penitentiary because that's where all these kids end up and that's where, that's the track they, it's always been. Your kid just happens to be a white kid caught up in a system that was meant to control kids of color back in the day. And that's what the facility where your son is now is, that's where it started out as, as a prison for kids of color. I was looking to find out how many systems, in fact, do use solitary confinement, how many juvenile systems. And um, this, is, this is not easy information to get, certainly from the states themselves. It's more numerous than we would like to think. There's evidence that this is being used in Texas, in Florida, in Virginia, but we don't really know the extent to which this may be problematic.
it kind of crept up without anybody noticing. You know, the, the regulations change, nobody understands them very well. Nobody pays attention because, after all, these are criminals and, you know, if they're in prison, it must be for something. There's no transparency, there's no accountability in the prison system. Nobody sees that except for people like us. And, and then we're thought of as, like, you know, the criminals that raise the criminals, right? So why listen to some mom who's agonizing over her son? It's a kind of uh, attitude that, uh, you know, that, uh, that makes us all responsible for what we do to our fellow men and women, uh, but we don't feel responsibility because it's uh, something that will never happen to us. Despite the lack of information about young people in solitary confinement, last year's report by the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition hints at the size and the scope of the practice. According to state records in 2012, 36,000 juveniles were held in solitary confinement in Texas for an average stay of six months. The most common reasons for isolation were a failure to attend school, and for their own protection. The expedient of putting them in solitary confinement for their own protection, quote unquote, uh, seems to me uh, uncalled for because first, most of the time they don't ask for it. And second, if they, uh, even if they ask for it, uh, it is the prison's burden uh, to protect them and at the same time don't inflict uh, cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment on them. Uh, uh, under the guise of protection. In 2006, a young man um, called to recount a story about his time in this prison with my son. And he told about my son being raped in solitary confinement by another young person. Um, and this young man was put into a cell by guards and it was like a wrestling match is what it was you know like they took bets on which kid would win and this other young man raped my son while the guards just stood there and egged it on and tried to get you know saying to my son you need to fight back you know and calling him a pussy and That was, um, that was sort of this moment where you realized that all those things you saw and you heard over the years, you didn't escape that and he didn't escape that. That's what happened to him and that's why he had become so nervous and anxious and edgy and had changed from a really good kid who was grieving his, the loss of his grandmother into what society now labels a criminal. And the next witness to testify is Ms. Bauer. Afternoon, Chairman Scott and committee members. How I got to testify before Congress was because I was white and I look like white legislators in Louisiana that we needed to convince to stop doing this to children. And so I got chosen as a spokesperson. We passed the Juvenile Justice Reform Act of 2003, which a lot of folks in this country call the most comprehensive piece of um, criminal justice reform legislation in 40 years in our country and we literally dropped the number of kids in state secure care from 2000 to less than 400 where it remains today. We actually changed the way we incarcerated children in our state. We need to ensure that incarceration is used to punish, to deter, and to rehabilitate, but not merely to warehouse and to forget. After years of neglect, the voices of parents, prisoners, psychologists, and civil libertarian groups are starting to be heard by those in political power. Attorney General Eric Holder amended the Prison Rape Elimination Act to ensure that prison employees are screened for prior sexual abuse. And a United States Senate hearing on solitary confinement, the first of its kind, was chaired by Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois. This is the first ever congressional hearing on solitary confinement. The United States holds far more prisoners in segregation or solitary confinement than any other democratic nation on earth. 
Durbin heard from experts, questioned the director of federal prisons, and even brought in a replica of an isolation cell onto the Senate floor. We're seeing an alarming increase in isolation for those who don't really need to be there. And for many, many vulnerable groups like immigrants, children, LGBT inmates, supposedly there for their own protection. I thought it was absolutely terrific that the Congress, and Durbin in particular, took such an interest that has made a big difference in the, um, in the field. In recent years, seven states have either banned or restricted the use of solitary confinement for children. Despite the prohibitions, Grace Bauer believes that a permanent solution requires greater transparency behind prison walls. We have had laws in place in this country since the Juvenile Justice Delinquency and Prevention Act was passed, I believe, for the, in 1974. Until there are more eyes focused on what goes on behind the walls of prisons in this country, we can never rest. So do I believe the law is the answer? I actually don't. The answers are, um, in the case of uh, protective custody in adult facilities, don't send kid to ad kids to adult facilities, period. I would say, for example, that using it on uh, minors, on, on juveniles, should always be prohibited because the literature shows very clearly that the effect on uh, the brain and the mind uh, of, uh, of an underage person is very different uh, than, in a, than in an adult. And they can never function productively as uh, citizens, again, in the, in the real world. Yeah, I mean, my first paid performance here. Michael Kemp was released from prison in 2008. After living in homeless shelters, he now works with the Campaign for Youth Justice, teaching young people to stay out of prison. Today, he's rebuilding his life while reading and writing poetry in Washington, D.C. Following his release from prison, Corey Bauer struggled with drug addiction and the challenges of everyday life. Without a work history or job skills, he was finally able to find a job delivering food for a local restaurant until this happened. He went to the pizza place where he had been working and delivering pizzas, and he went in with a BB gun and his friend, and he held the place up, and he stole the weekend deposit bag and drove off. The police picked him up less than a mile away. He got out of the car, laid down on the ground, confessed to the entire crime, and ask for mercy for his friend. Corey is currently serving a 12-year prison sentence for his crime. Grace Bauer continues to fight for prison reform. It's not until people tell you about their child who's been in prison and what that's been like in their lives and what it's been like for, for their loved one that I think people that's never experienced can begin to see really what the long-term horrific consequences are of society's taste for punishment.